Hi and welcome to MS Endpoint Manager's YouTube channel. Today we have Rod on the as as a guest speaker, and we have Michael. We have Jan. Great to see you all. Thank you, Matthias. Yep. Good day. This is awesome. So uh, Rod, to be here. Yeah. Yes. Cool. And we 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 want to know you better. So. Uh. Oh my goodness! I don't, I don't know Give if you some actually goodies. know me any better than you know me already. Yeah, we know you from some <clears throat> something called KQL, but give us a little bit about yourself. A little bit about myself. Um, so I am Rod Trent. That's that's my my full name, my full given name. Um, I am a cloud security advocate at Microsoft. Um, a lot of people see a title like that and they see that word advocate and they think I'm just some kind of marketing evangelist person. Um, but we've kind of changed that role at Microsoft pretty significantly so that we can provide some additional value for our customers. So just so people understand, and as we get into deeper discussion, I think about our topics today, it'll become even more clear why this is the way it is. <clears throat> so as an advocate at Microsoft, you might think that I'm an advocate for our products or the product that I cover, you know, whether it's Microsoft Sentinel or Defender or even the KQL stuff. <clears throat> and that's absolutely true. But my primary role at Microsoft is being an advocate for our customers and our partners, right? So my job is whatever I happen to do, whatever project I'm on or whatever thing that I'm doing, whether it's speaking at a conference or a webinar or writing documentation or whatever, um, my goal is to take feedback from our customers and our partners and take it directly back to our product teams. I work directly with our product teams and we have these debriefs, you know, after some of these events, conferences, things like this, when I'm able to get and glean feedback from our customers and partners. And we have these meetings, right? And we talk about what that feedback is. And then based on that meeting, I advocate for our customers. I say, okay, here's the problems they're having. Here's the big issues. Here's the bugs they found, whatever it happens to be. And then we make that determination based on that meeting, what the results of that feedback will be. And we literally look at everything, right? Okay, so this is a bug. Okay, we'll put this into the system. This is a feature request. You know, we'll see where this fits on the roadmap. Um, maybe our docs need to be updated. Maybe they're not clear enough. Right. Maybe it's a brand new feature that needs to be um, created eventually. Right. So whatever that feedback is, it comes back and then we determine, you know, how that what the results of that feedback will be. So that's my job at Microsoft is literally just be a really good listener. You know, the notepad and the, you know, my pen, I always got it sitting here at the ready just to kind of take those notes, take it back to the product team, because I, I hope and. You know, I, I, I really do hope that people, our customers and our partners do see that there is significant effort on our part over, especially over the past, you know, three, four or five years with our products to produce and develop things that customers actually want. <laughs> um, Microsoft Sentinel is a great example. Um, it has this very accelerated, very quick development cycle where there's a lot of new features that comes out literally every week, sometimes every day, right? But yeah. all of the things that you see that get released into GA or public preview or whatever, all comes from that customer feedback. The things that you see in Microsoft Sentinel Day versus when it was originally released back in 2019, I would say probably 92, 90 to 92%. I may be wrong, but it's pretty high. 90, 92% of what you see in Microsoft Sentinel today was customer or partner driven. So that's that's pretty significant. So I, I see my role as kind of super important. Um, maybe others don't see it that way. Maybe even my colleagues like you're stupid for saying that. But I, I absolutely do. <laughs> I love to advocate for our customers and our partners. Great to hear. Great to hear. So we need more of your types in in, in every area of, of Microsoft products, actually. Yep. Yeah. Um, so the rock clones, we need exactly. rock clones. <laughs> I don't know if you want that either. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, you get backgrounds <laughs> like this for everybody, which is kind of cool, but you know. Yeah. You <laughs> yeah. So it's 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 no secret that more and more Microsoft products is actually using some kind of query language. Um, once upon a time, we used uh, SQL a lot. Yep. And now moving to the cloud. 
We have lots of lots of customers, Michael, Jan, myself. We're moving customers from, from on-prem to, to the cloud. We need to learn a new language, isn't it so? Well, <clears throat> I would say it's important. You know, it's not, I don't think, necessary. In fact, if you look at what we have been accomplishing, particularly on the Defender 365 Defender side, and there's some other cases right now already, um, this query language, which we'll talk about, um, mm -hmm. is kind of the back end engine for producing, you know, these reports and the results and things like this. We've done some things even recently where we made it easy for customers instead of learning the query language, just to click on things to kind of create the results for the the results that they're looking for from security purpose. But on the back end, yes, absolutely, it is all driven by this crazy query language, commonly referred to as KQL or Custo query language, right? Not um, KQL. We're, not we're set on well, that. You not know, KQL. <laughs> a wise product manager once said to me, and I totally appreciated this, we don't care what they call it as long as they use it. So you call it whatever you want. I don't care. It's wise. Um, even though it is a little bit, <clears throat> it does kind of make me, <laughs> yeah, whatever. I'm yanking your chain there. It's, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I would never call it that in, no. a, in a meeting. Oh, damn, I'm in a meeting. Love yeah. <laughs> So when we talk about this language, Rod, I mean, yeah, where did it come from? I mean, suddenly there is this new language. And I mean, if you've been working with security, you might have been doing queries in a Splunk dashboard or right. other areas, but it's not the same, is it? So so where is the, how did you come up with this language? And what's uh, it's based on something, right? Yep. So this language was intentionally designed as a simplification to SQL or SQL query language, right? So a lot of people refer to it as like SQL plus or something because it's a little bit better. Um, but it actually comes from, it was invented or developed by four people at Microsoft. They're referred to as either the Four Horsemen or uh, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um, we're actually going to have one of them on our Microsoft Security Insights show here in a nut too distant future. So that'll be something of interest for everybody to hear one of the inventors talk about it. But as, as we at Microsoft started actually eating the dog food, right? Started using our own products as we kind of migrated workloads to the cloud, particularly security, we identified very quickly that the query languages that already existed um, were just a non-thing. It just didn't, act, didn't work in the cloud didn't take advantage of the cloud resources that are available. Because when you think of it from a security person or analyst perspective, if you're looking for a threat or something in your environment that might potentially be a threat, a threat, you need those results to come back extremely quickly. You don't need to wait three or four days. Great uh, story, a customer that I worked with a couple of years ago um, in Oklahoma, of all places, um, it was a municipality, <clears throat> law enforcement would come to them and say, hey, we want this data. You know, this is what we're looking for. Um, their SLA to return that data for law enforcement was three days because they knew that the tool that they use, it wasn't Microsoft Sentinel, by the way. It was one of the competing products. I won't say it. Um, but the tool that they used, they knew that they had to create the query. They had to debug the query and it took time to even run the query. And if the query failed and they hadn't debugged it correctly, they'd have to start all over again. Um, but because of the mass amount of data that they had collected and stored on premises for so long in their data centers, it took up to three days sometimes to return that data. And that's pretty crazy, right? Um, from an analyst perspective. What I ended up doing for that customer, they were interested in Microsoft Sentinel. I was there to deliver a workshop for Microsoft Sentinel. Um, I took their data, stuck at Microsoft Sentinel, same data they had, same data they were querying, and the same stuff came back in 15 seconds or less. Oh, the right. reason why KQL was created because of that gap that we saw as we started looking at this stuff ourselves, trying to use this. Um, the query language itself is not this phenomenal brand new thing, even though it's more simple to learn and utilize than SQL uh, for those SQL engineers that are used to that. But what it does is it takes advantage of the cloud. It takes advantage of cloud resources, compute, 
um, the performance, uh, clustering, all the stuff that's necessary to get those results back in a very quick and timely manner for security analysts. So just just to get get a clear picture, I'm I'm the noob here. So yep, KQL is a Microsoft invention. It is a Microsoft invention. Um, it is utilized across almost, well, I would say 99.9% .9 of our services um, because all of our services, whether it's Microsoft Sentinel, which I've talked about, or Azure Activity, or even things like Microsoft Intune, right? Um, all of those produce log files and we need to be able to sift through and look through those log files. So it absolutely works across all of Microsoft services and applications. However, um, it also works. There's a plugin for like Jupyter Notebooks, which is an open source thing, right? I've also heard recently that some one, at least one of our competitors in the SIEM or SIM market, whatever you want to call it, um, is actually getting ready to also adopt KQL because of um, the way that it works, because of the power behind the query language. Not, not the query language itself, which is, you know, I think it's awesome, but because of how it takes advantage of all those attributes of the cloud to return those results very quickly. And the one I'm talking about that's thinking about using it, their query language is pretty dismal, so. All right, so when we're talking about it's using the power of the cloud and all the compute resources and stuff like that, yep. is there um, is there like a, a service behind that? Like you, you're using log analytics, right? All the data's in log analytics, so all the different <laughs> systems are querying that. Like what kind of engine is behind that? I'm guessing it's not like a SQL server or or it's, is it? It's not. No, it's, it's not SQL Server. Um, it's so it works with log analytics, obviously, and also Azure Data Explorer. But, you know, most of the things that we store um, sits in a Cosmos DB. Um, not necessarily that you can query that with KQL. You can access that with our APIs. But, yeah, there is some some additional power and stuff behind that. Awesome. I did not know that Cosmos DB was behind that. I think that's interesting, given the power of Cosmos DB. Yep. Cool. Awesome. So yeah. So so when you when we start learning this, so let's. I want us to focus about how we can learn this thing, right? Oh. Yeah. Um, and um, I think that's the for our reviewers as well. Is <laughs> like, how can I get started with this custo? I mean, you 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 have said it this. I have said it on stage many times. KQL is a new PowerShell. And then we get these stupid questions back, like, "How can I, uh, how can I, I do this and this, and how can I install this with Custo?" But they don't get the message behind <laughs> the statement on the T-shirt, yep. because I don't know. All of us on this call, we remember some years back when PowerShell came out. What was the some statement? years back? What was, what the, was statement? the statement that yep. we need that everybody got to learn? You, you got to learn, learn PowerShell. PowerShell. Yeah. Right. Even yeah. even Jeffrey Snover, the inventor of PowerShell, back when it was it 2008, right? I think. Yeah. He was like, you yeah, must sure. learn this, and everybody's like, ah, I'm busy. Um, but they found out very quickly they needed to learn it. I'm still running into to guys that manage their job without it, and uh, all power to them if they if they want to do that. Um, but they're really missing out, and I I just want to put that here in video. They're missing out because PowerShell is you know, still the go to miss out on the next big thing. And, I'm telling you exactly like yeah. you, you yeah. got to get on board with it. So, and I, as we spoke about before the meeting started here, uh, I started with OMS back in the day and really saw some great potential in that. Mm -hmm. Then it yeah. got scrapped for some reason. They wanted to call it log analytics instead, um, which was probably a good move because <laughs> yeah. uh, a lot of people were sort of confused about what, how could they use OMS? They thought it was the new SCOM or something like that. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I felt like back then it was pretty easy to get into, but it wasn't as mature back then. And now I've completely dropped off for some time and now it's becoming, you know, it's it's um, blooming or what do you call it? Um, again, because it's yeah. integrated into so many services now and it's becoming the default standard for all the new querying in Microsoft products. Um, so, as Jan said, how do we get how started with learning learn this? That? Yeah. <clears throat> so there's, there's at this point, there's like a hundred different ways that you can learn KQL. When I started with this, when I started down this trek, um, this was actually 
this is November. So yeah, it was November last year. I sat in a in a product team meeting last year in September. <clears throat> and one of the things that just really smacked me in the face when they said it was that our customers were not using our security products because they found it difficult to use our query language. I had spent like the last two years prior to that delivering these Microsoft Sentinel workshops. I, I think one year I delivered like 80 some, something like that. So it was like literally, you know, like three workshops a week. And it was at that, in, in during that workshop, four day workshops, it was like the second day when I started talking about KQL, it's when the light bulb went off in the attendees heads. They were like, oh, analytics rules, the workbooks. All I got to do is just figure this KQL query language out and I can do all this stuff. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and so, you know, teaching that for a couple of years and I heard that, I thought, man, that's just the silliest thing. Why, why is that a barrier to customers utilizing or why should it be? It shouldn't be, right? A barrier to utilizing our security products. So is that last year? So it's been, yeah, just a little over a year. I started, I thought, nah, I'm just going to kind of Take this a step at a time, walk through, <clears throat> have a security focus, but talk about KQL and just kind of piece it out. So I don't know how long it's going to go. I don't know how many chapters or how many um, how many parts of the series ended up being 20 chapters. <clears throat> um, but what I wanted to do is start from the very, very beginning, talk about it, talk about where it came from, talk about why it exists, like we've talked about today, and then go through the very common. Um, KQL operators and functions and stuff like that, that they would see using our security products. And so over the course of about four or five months, you know, I finally finished it, got to chapter 20. And this thing just literally took off on its own. I had no clue, right? This was the first, like one of the first learnings for KQL. Um, but since then we have learn modules. Um, we have, they're part of some of our ex SC series exams. You have to know KQL to pass some of these exams. Um, so we have learn modules. There's a lot of, we have workshops internally for our partners, for ourselves. And in fact, I'm participating once the new year starts helping teach our people. There's, um, it's required, this series that I created, which is called Must Learn KQL. You can go to mustlearnkql.com to find it. Um, it. It's actually a requirement by our DART people internally to go through this series before they can start searching and helping our customers, you know, identify threats in their environment and stuff like this. There's a lot of ways to learn KQL these days, but I, I would, you know, I'm, this is not a pat on the back kudos to me, but I would start with the KQL series because like I said, it's, it's, it's changed a lot of people's lives. Just going through this very simple, quick chapters, all hands-on. I, there's a demo um, environment that's part of it. So you, you're actually typing out queries and you're learning while you're kind of typing these things out and looking at the results. Um, but very easy to learn, very easy to get through. And then at the end, you can request a certificate for finishing the series. And I have, uh, over the course of the past, since November last year, have handed out 1,600, over 1,600 certificates for this series, which is pretty significant when you think about what we do for some of our other stuff, like our Ninja series, you know, Microsoft Sentinel Ninja and the Defender for Cloud Ninja, all the Ninja stuff, they very rarely get up to, you know, seven, 800 sometimes. So that's, that's pretty good. Bravo. I'm missing out, I can see, because, you know, Yen and Matthias, they obviously got that certificate. No, I, I, I don't <laughs> no. have the certificate. I, uh, no, you don't. Oh. I, I think when, it's an when, open book when, test, too, by the way. So. Yeah, oh, but I think when, no when, when, Rod, when Rod started with this, I was kind of, uh, already passed this beginner status in my head. Yeah. So I kind of was already so far ahead in my learning that maybe it's a good thing to sometimes to step back, but I kind of, yeah, I just continued. So yeah, I might, I might once do it to just get the certificate, but um, I think my uh, skill set in this is... Uh, Oh, I do. I, I, I completely, I completely agree with you. By the way, so if yeah, if you don't want to do it, that's fine. I'm, I, I, I took the A set nine hundred a few weeks ago, so you know, there's nothing too embarrassing about that. <laughs> I just, I just thought, ah, that's the only one I'm really missing within my field, so I needed to just have that badge in there on Credly. <laughs> so one, one thing I do want to highlight, and um, 
want to ensure that people also know. So after the Must Learn KQL series, um, I had planned to do like an advanced KQL series. Um, and and that's kind of gotten stagnant. But at in the interim, um, what I would actually suggest for folks, so those four horsemen, those Teenage, teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles I talked about, um, helped develop a brand new advanced learning series called um Cousteau detective agency i don't know if anyone's familiar with this cool. you go to, what is it Cousteau.detective.io. i believe that's the actual url um you can actually join the Cousteau detective agency you get a free uh, cluster of Cousteau, and they give you all of the instructions on how to ingest some custom data for each case it's up to case five well this is first season is almost over here case five is the latest one um it's actually extremely cool we had i was part of some folks that talked about this early this year um and they didn't take my idea unfortunately um it's probably better that they didn't my idea was hey let's just um let's 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 bring in some actual investigators let's make this like a scooby-doo episode and bring in mystery ink and all that stuff <laughs> it, they obviously went with something else, but that's okay. That um, actually sounds pretty fun. So, yeah, but no, this get is, the that, kids this is, hooked. This is so. just as fun. This is just as fun. One of the, I think it's the third episode. Um, Jan, you have to help me with this one, but I think that was the one where it actually sent you to latitude, longitude, and Google Maps, and you had to look up some clues, and that was part uh, of the answer. That. No, that was the fourth. That was the fourth one. Okay. All right. Yeah. That so, was just absolutely blew my mind. That was cool. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, at least four and five are connected. Um, yeah. So case four and five are connected. And, um, you know, it's not the fun thing about it, the detective agency is that it's not only about Custo. It's about also think about how you need to analyze the data. It's not yeah. just about the language. It's about what you need to think how would a bank robber think how yeah. would a uh, uh a gang of terrorists think or something and that is kind of puts you in a mindset to say okay the, i need to anal try to analyze this data this way instead of this way so it's not only about the language itself it's also about where do where do i even start here yeah it's like yeah. It's, uh, the, the last yeah. couple of cases has been really really challenging on um, where do i even start i have all this data where am i starting and most of the time you start in the total wrong direction and you find out <laughs> oh, this is not leading yeah. anywhere but then you yeah. go back and you know, maybe you talk to a colleague that is also re really skilled in this area and you get some pointers and you give some pointers back and at the end of the day we find it out yeah it's absolutely absolutely neat and i want to correct myself here real quick just for people listening in it's actually detective.custo.io. I said custo.detective.io, so I got mixed up. Awesome. So detective.custo.io. Yeah. Let, uh, we'll, let me just we'll put it in the description. The, yeah. Um, let me just ask a question again as the, the noob here. Look, so somebody completely new, we're just watching this video and want to get started. We're hearing about this detective agency stuff. And uh, I think we're, we're focusing a lot around um, threat hunting, right? And yeah. analyzing security related instance so is good, yeah. there like some path a person should choose to go down or are there even multiple paths so let's say you you have uh intune as well so you have just regular corporate data you're querying just to uh, make things work you know and then right. you have the investigative parts where you're looking for uh criminal activity or threats or non-updated computers or whatever so there are a lot of different paths here all using Custo Query, does it differentiate in any way, depending on what kind of work you're doing, or is it just a common path? It's it's or... it's, it's only what you're looking for, right? Um, so from a security perspective, you're looking for potential threats and the threat actors and users who do bad things sometimes. Don't necessarily mean to all the time, but they do things that you know might impact the environment. From an Intune perspective, you're usually looking for troubleshooting. You're looking for compliance and things like that same data, same data structure. It's just the things that you look for are just a little bit different. So when you're learning this query language, yeah, if you start with must learn KQL, it's going to show you not just um, 
the security aspect, it's also going to teach you the workflow. You know, this is what a standard query workflow looks like. You can shortcut the process and just use this one search operator if you want to do that just to kind of start the whole process and then you start, but it teaches you how to build your query all the way to the end, right? Obviously, that one ends with how to build your first Microsoft Analytics rule, but you don't have to do that, right? You, it's going to help you. And if you, if you go to, you know, my GitHub repository, just search for rod dash trend on GitHub, I, I worked with a customer heavily um, a couple years back. Um, they were uh, wanting to send Intune, their Intune logs, and this is before Intune started really kind of supporting all this stuff, uh, sending Intune logs to Microsoft Sentinel. They're using Microsoft Sentinel as their seam. And if you go out to my GitHub repository, you want to do some comparison between some of the security stuff and the Intune stuff. I have a lot of Intune um, query uh, queries out there, some analytics rules, some workbooks and things like this that I developed working with that customer. Cool. It has this is um, the, yeah, detective Cousteau, detective .cousteau .io. This is the agency. And you kind of see I have, well, so the fifth one, I've completed it. However, I have, you're supposed to actually come back on, I think it's, well. Don't say the date. Don't okay, say sorry, the date. No, that's, I, that's, I forgot. That's part of the answer. <laughs> um, I actually have it set in my Outlook calendar to remind me, even though I'm going to be off for the holiday, I'm going to come back and finish this because I want that badge. Um, that's another cool thing about this is as you finish these, uh, and maybe I shouldn't go through here and show you all the answers. I'll just stay here. Um, <laughs> Please do. Yeah. So you can see over here on the left-hand side, right, all these badges that I've acquired by finishing these different cases. You get badges for it. They're also, they're part of Credly. So they show awesome. up as part of your certification stuff, right? Hey, I've got this cool Custo badge. The other piece of this yeah. is, you know, if I click on any of these and I do need some help, um, I can actually go to the hints. Um, so if I was on one of the cases where, you know, I needed a hint, I could go in here and you can actually share, you know, to Twitter or Facebook or some of the social media sites, you can actually share something and it will give you a hint back. So it's, it's helping proliferate or, you know, kind of market this detective agency thing, um, which is super cool. I don't know if, um, You've all noticed that have gone through this, Jan, but um, <clears throat> one of the one of the four horsemen pays attention to LinkedIn when people actually post that they've gotten their latest badge. He goes in and likes everything and stuff like that, uh, which I think is hugely important. Shows the kind of that personal touch, right, for this, which is pretty cool. So yeah, this is oh, definitely the, yeah, this is the, the Cousteau Detective Agency. You can see what this looks like. Big heist gives you a, a story problem, gives you a use case. And then you kind of have to figure out what's going on here. There's um, the instructions I talked about earlier on how to ingest the custom logs. And in fact, everything, let me see. If you go to MS slash Custo free, um, anyone can do this. Let me go there real quick. <clears throat> anyone who has a Microsoft account can get a free uh, Custo cluster. Taking a second to pull up, which is bothering me. It's taking a second, probably because it's presenting, trying to split slices with everything else. Um, <clears throat> anyone that has a Microsoft account, there we go, can create their own Custo queries, right? So even if you're not using Microsoft Sentinel, even if you're not using Intune or anything like that, and you still want to get some experience and practice with KQL, if you go to aka.ms slash Custo free, you can create your own uh, cluster and you can start doing your own querying, right? Um, this is all of the data that's, uh, I don't even wanna show you, I should, probably shouldn't even show you the um, the queries that probably cheats on the de detective thing, but anyway. Um, <laughs> I will, we'll, um, I'll, I'll uh, cover my eyes and you'll yeah, just no. keep talking. <laughs> all right, no, this isn't, this is something else I would on for somebody else. Okay, um, but you create your own, the, the beauty of this, so if you're using Microsoft Sentinel and you're using um, Intune, you're kind of stuck with the data that is ingested or data that's supplied from that source, from that device or from, you know, whatever it has to be. Custo free are these Custo clusters that anyone can get access to. You can actually ingest your own custom data. You have some cool data from HR that's in, sitting in a CSV or something. Won't you just go ahead and ingest it here? And then you can start querying that data and getting some practice with other types of data. I think there's um, one, and I forget the actual, URL, but there's um, one resource out there that actually just focuses on weather patterns. 
right? And stuff like that. So you can you get some really good um, use cases and really good experience. Um, and so we've talked about this from a security perspective and in tune and stuff like this and this detective stuff. Really what this is, right, is data engineering. You're literally, when you're doing this, whether you're a security analyst or you're someone that's checking for compliance, you are doing um, data science. You are a data scientist. And this is an absolutely awesome area or career to be in, right? If you know how to manipulate and monitor and look at the data, you're going to have a full and wonderful professional life because data is data is everything. Um, hmm. it, you know, you can learn any product <laughs> out there. You can learn Defender. You can learn Defender for Endpoint. You can know how to click boxes. But once you know how to manipulate and look at that data and monitor, because when you think about where we're at um, in, you know, in technology, people are migrating to the cloud and stuff like this. It's less about managing those devices. Anybody can click a box. Anybody can click a little toggle switch and Defender or what have you in Intune, right, to ensure that your devices are compliant. Um, but not many people can actually, you know, look through this data, right? Need to be able to kind of look at this data. So we're at an interesting juncture where it's less about managing and more about monitoring. So some management types going to come up. Hey, are we compliant? Well, I checked that box, but I need to kind of figure out if we really are compliant. You have to type out some queries and create a report, right? So that's why this is so significantly important, I believe. Yeah, and I'm thinking people could use this as a career booster as well in in, in other fields, like if they want to switch fields, you know, learning, querying, or analyzing data like this. Yep. is isn't too uh, far off on what, what they're doing in the medicinal industry as well, right? So you've got all the yeah. big data coming in. Uh, genomes and stuff that need to be processed. I, I know my, I have my sister, she's a PhD in microbiology. She's using something similar to, to Kusto to actually query the data and she gets paid quite well for it. Uh, and it's, um, it's not many people that can do it. She found out it's pretty niche still. Uh, a lot of people say they can do it, but they're not doing it efficiently. Like with, with querying languages like this, um, I think that's Pretty interesting for people to just take a takeaway from this. You know, you're learning one thing, but you're also you're, you're learning more than just the language, right? The analytic capabilities are also important. Talking about efficiency and, and querying stuff, um, I, I think is is there any better way of querying stuff, or can we just put stuff in there? You know, when, when you code stuff. <laughs> You need to make your code efficient and 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 fast. Is, yep. is it is it the same with KQL? It is. There there is some best practices as there are with anything. Um, I don't necessarily think you know we'll go into that as part of this. But what I what I really kind of wanted to accomplish is just to give people the incentive to get started. Right. It's like you hear something, somebody says you must learn. It's like the PowerShell thing. You must learn PowerShell. Oh, my goodness. Nobody wants to <laughs> drop everything they're doing to go learn something that's going to, you know, take six months or a year. or They need a training course to be able to accomplish, um, which, you know, PowerShell is obviously not. But, you know, I think people kind of get overwhelmed when they want they need to they feel like they need to learn something new. Um, but I just kind of want to get people started again, giving them an incentive just to see how easy this is. Um, there's one KQL operator that I always, always, always revert to the first thing. As a security person, somebody says, hey, um, could you find this? Or we're, you know, we think that this is going on and I'm just going to use some things here. It's the search. Search is the most simple, easy operator. And from there you build, right? From there you start to build. But if I want to search for something, all I have to do is search for, um, let's just search for my name. Maybe over the last 24 hours, something should come up here very quickly. Um, five seconds. It's actually taking longer than it should. Um, probably because, again, we're presenting here or whatever. I should come back much more quickly. But as you see, as we start kind of tuning this stuff, we'll, we'll be able to tune it so that the query does come back a lot quicker. Again, that's taking longer. I feel like I feel so bad about this. It's taking I, I will testament to having seen it run a lot faster. So I'll yeah. uh, I'll give you an alibi there, Rod. Let's go back <laughs> about three days. I was at a conference last week, doing some uh, 
demos. Uh, who do I want? Oh, Shaylon, which if you know, that's that's a six million dollar man character on the TV show. Um, hopefully that comes back just a little bit quicker. Okay, so while this is doing it, and it's it's making me eat my words that this is very quick returns and quick result. There we go. Yay. Um, so I mean, the, we didn't we didn't hear how big the data set is. So is this a sixty five well, petabyte database? So that was pretty quick, I'd say. So this is uh, <laughs> what 41, 41 rows total from the last seven days. So that's not very big at all. I this is my demo environment. I don't keep a lot of extra data here. So this is my demo stuff. This is the stuff where I, cool. you know, I show off Microsoft Sentinel and things like that. So there's not a lot of stuff here. Um, so I'm very quickly, the first thing that, like I said, the only, first thing that I always reach for is search. So I know that, I do know that this thing that someone said, hey, Rod, go check to see what Shailon is doing or check to see if there's some kind of something going on with this individual within our organization. So the first thing I reach for is search. Very easy, very quick. Ah, you know what? I could be done. I could go down through this and do this whole manual representation and look through all of these these things down here, all of these these incidents, or let's call them <clears throat> incidents where Shalon has done something within our environment in the last seven days. Um, but what I really want to get to at this point is just say, hey, um, I want to I want to see all the all of the places that Shalon exists when in my environment. So I now know that Shalon has done something within the past seven days within my environment. Um, and what just happened? Something's going on here. Oh, it would help if I would um, if I would say table instead of tables. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so that's an honest mistake. Yeah. So now I I I, I know that something's going on within that Shailen's done within my environment. Now I want to know where she did something. So I look at the tables where Shailen exists within my environment, and as an analyst, I look through that and I think, all right. So there's some sign-in events. Um, behavior analytics, which is something very specific that Microsoft Sentinel. There's some other things I've queried against her before, and LA query logs, the audit logs, cloud app events, right? So Shailon has been part of these things. Um, to me, as an analyst, I'm thinking, okay, if, if something's going on, probably Shailon has been in the sign-in log. So let's take a look. Just add uh, sign-in logs. And then we're going to search for Shailon again. Let's see what kind of activity she's been doing uh, for sign-ins. All right. So we can kind of see here really quickly four events over the past seven days. Something going on here. Um, kind of see what is going on. Take a look real quick. See where Shailon is actually located. Um, we want to start kind of digging in and figuring out exactly what she is doing. Um, I can go back up here. I go to the sign in logs um, where user, uh, I think it's user display name, all right, contains Shalon. So I'm starting to build out my query. Yeah, and I just want to ask a question about that, Rod. So you're doing a lot of small, cool things here uh, that maybe a novice wouldn't know what's going on here, like if I've never okay. seen it. So you're just running parts of that query just so. The listener is not thinking this is a complete query, right? It's just right. running so the, the selected. Yeah. yeah. So the first thing I did was just literally search. Then I determined where Shailon existed in my data. Then I searched that specific thing that I'm interested in, that specific table, which is called sign-in logs. Sign-in logs and audit logs are part of Azure Active Directory. Those are the, There's some other logs it creates, but those are the ones for me that are more significant for a security analyst view. I want to look at their sign-ins and their auditing of you know, them logging into my network or logging into my environment. The next thing I did, I just took that that table, now that I know Shailon absolutely exists in that table, and I'm going to start querying, I'm going to start building out a query to get exactly the response or the returns that I want. That's going to give me an indicator of exactly what that person did in my environment. So first thing I do is I take that table name, right, sign in logs. And if you saw that, if I was a little slower about it, I apologize. Um, we have IntelliSense built into KQL, right? So all the tables that exist under sign-in logs, I really, if I take advantage of this, I don't have to type a lot, right? Sign-in logs, okay, I'm going to tab, and it's going to automatically create the next 
line for me, the next command. And guess what? Where or the filter for my table is probably the first thing that most people do. This helps you build that entire structure for this KQL query. So there's, it does a lot of the stuff for you. So now I'm going to do where, right? Um, and I know that just by looking through the data that I have, if I went over to probably a bad way to do it, especially with, um, there we go. User display name is Shalon, right? So then I took that column where that data exists, again, using the IntelliSense. Um, I usually like to use contains. You can actually use, if I know it is absolutely Shalon, right? I can do an equals, you know, that specific username. But in the event, I don't know exactly what that person's name is, or maybe there's, you know, some other identifiers as part of that person's name. Um, I can use contains. I use contains a lot. Um, for that specific. Yeah, I want to ask a question, Rod, because lately I've been seeing a lot of, uh, you see you have some red line under contains and it says you should use has. <clears throat> well, actually in this case, contains is the better and more and better performant um, um, uh, function or process. Uh, there is, so KQL has been around a while. As with any Microsoft product, there's advances, changes, things like that, right? So there is actually an operator called has, and there is one called contains. There's literally no difference between them except how that utilizes the backend. Contains is actually better performant than the has. So just- but Does it support wildcards like so, so like? I like? am <laughs> I am assuming though that they are want me to use the has because that use less compute. Is that it? Is yep. it that simple? That's correct. Yeah, it 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 may be maybe slower, but it uses less resources, so it's better for everyone, yep. except me for waiting for the result. <laughs> yeah, that's right. All but right. that has a use case as well for anything that's just running in the background. So if you're doing uh, working in Defender for Endpoint or in something like that, you're doing some queries, automated autom automated queries or something. Would that make sense to just have that run a bit slower and not? Bog down the system because I'm guessing there's some resource allocations and some throttling going on in your tenant, right? So, so there you is want to some, resource, some resources. Yeah, at resource allocations, that is all. Um, the user can't see any of that. And in fact, these exactly. queries that we're running here cost nothing. So it's not like you're trying to save costs by making something run slower or producing or delivering, you know, different or less results. So this is all kind of built into the process, right? Yeah, yeah. there's one one uh, there is one command I have started using a lot lately when I I mean I meet new especially when I meet new tables. Yeah. And that is the get schema. Ah. That is an interesting one. Um I'll show you a couple ways to do that. So the same sign in logs. So this is like the Rosetta Stone of um Oh man. There you go. So use get schema. It's an operator that literally tells you the different columns and the types of data that exist within that specific table, right? So this is all the stuff, the column names that are part of this. This is important because schema changes regularly, <laughs> unfortunately. And it can change at the most inopportune times, but being able to know how what the schema looks like, there's a reference um, out in our learn documentation Every single table that we produce, every service, every application, every table that we produce, there's a long list that you can like sift through and look at this there as well. I could also go over here, there's my sign-in logs. And if I hover for just a second, um, I can go look at that table, right? I can also see some preview data. So it actually writes that query and runs it in the background for me to look at, look at what is gonna be in there so I can get a good understanding, right? Um, of what that is. Um, but there's there's multiple ways of getting that information. I can even tag it if it happens to be tagged. Um, this actually is, is the reference I talked about that takes you out to our sign logs and our learn documentation. There's all this stuff that gets updated. Um, the important thing to know here, important thing to note, um, and in fact, I don't have that screen shared, do I? Um, I should have. It, it took me off to our reference. I'm only sharing the tab. Um, the important thing about knowing about the get schema is because our schema changes more often than our documentation changes. 
So mm-hmm. the schema could change tomorrow, but the documentation may not be updated to reflect that schema change until next week. So if you're relying on our documentation for the specific schema stuff, then you should probably go back to the get schema stuff. So yeah, Jan, that's an important, important factor. Yeah, and also you can use this actually to not even find a schema for a table. If you have done some joining and and yep. use on MV apply, expand and stuff like that, then you can do a get schema of your current data as well. It will tell you if it's a string or it's a dynamic. And sometimes you need to know that to be able to know what you can do with the data because you can't do the same thing with a dynamic data type as you can a string. Yeah, that's very, very important. Very good, uh, very good point. For example, <clears throat> so when I create results, all those results that you see down at the bottom when I run a query, you know, I can get very specific, very granular about the results that come back. Talking about unions and joins, and even the extend, which I'm gonna show you here real quick, you're actually creating new tables. Um, you're actually creating the results of new tables by joining different tables or creating a union between them or extending um, certain columns and things like that. You're not actually creating a brand new table that exists in the system. You're only kind of create this in real time. So if I run a query and I create a join on those two different tables, the results is the view of those of that query that I created. That's not going to be saved so that you can do that next time. Right, it's not going to be saved to this table, but it's just the results that are shown. So that get schema also becomes extremely important in that case, just so you don't forget exactly what you created, right? Because you know, this is something we really probably shouldn't get into, something to learn later. But you can create functions. I can create a really super smart, intelligent query that's you know lines and lines of query, and I want to run that again, but you know I. I I don't want to just pull it up from a save GitHub repository or something. I can actually create a function out of that, save that in the system. So create a function, give it an alias, give it a special name, and just call that alias. So that entire query runs every single time. So it becomes more important. So if if I've forgotten what that join did or what those results are going to be, um, I can still use that get schema even with those functions. Awesome. Is that is that something you can share with? you know, your colleagues easily, you know, like, is that available for everybody in the same tenant or how does yep. that work with the functions? Absolutely. So um, anything that I create here, I can, yeah, I can copy a link to the query, send it to someone so that they click on it and automatically runs that query when they hit that link so they can see the results. As a security person, that's important to me because I can have another set of eyeballs. One of my colleagues actually take it out. I'll be like, you know, look at what this Shalon person did. Should they be able to do this? And I get a second set of eyeballs. They're like, oh my goodness, yeah, we should absolutely start to do some investigation. So I can link that, send them the query. I can actually copy the query text, send it that way, or, or just copy the results and send it as well. But I can share that. Um, I can also export, right, to a CSV for whatever. Well, I know why. Um, a lot of our customers before utilizing things like Microsoft Sentinel using some of those other products, it made it very difficult to actually search through the data, which we've talked about, difficult and, and time consuming. A lot of our customers have gone to exporting, running their queries and exporting the CSV files and then using, they found it easier to actually query in an Excel as an Excel spreadsheet in Excel, which is sad, absolutely sad. If your technology works that way, that forces you to do those really bad habits, then Get rid of that technology. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we can absolutely export um, the results here, ex- ex- export all the results that I have, all the columns, or only the displayed columns of this table or this, these results that I've created. I can also send it to Power BI really quickly and create some Power BI reports. Managers love the pretty reports, right? So while I'm looking they at do. some kind of you know static looking columns and rows of you know data that nobody wants to look at except for me. Um, I can send it to nice pretty queries, send the queries to nice pre- pretty reports that managers are like, oh, I love this. You guys are doing such a good job. Um, I can also okay. open it up to Excel here. I, I can sh- share these, I can save these, I can save this as a function, which I talked about earlier, and it's all contained um, within this. So. And then those functions, that was what I specifically actually was asking for, can, can those be made available so you create a function with an alias and it's something, you know, everybody in the company could get benefit from using. As long uh, as they have appropriate access 
to this workspace. All right. So these All functions right. are actually created in this workspace. Um, this okay, one's so workspace Microsoft specific. Sentinel, but you know, so obviously my analysts would, but I could it utilizes the same RBAC um, roles that you know anything does with an Azure. So I can yeah, give them access and they would have access to these functions. In fact, here's one of the functions that we have that's built into Microsoft Sentinel, which is a function, there's a query behind it, KQL query that literally goes out and looks at our watch lists or, or our um, the watch list that we use for Microsoft Sentinel for like trusted users and trusted IPs or nefarious IPs or whatever, you know, for threat intel. So. Yeah, so. because what you're saying here, Rod, you, you, you can't even query external data in here, right? You absolutely can. Which is which is something we have used for some things where you you could have like a static list, uh, XML list somewhere or some yes. uh, CSV file somewhere else in an Azure blob imported from another system. And you don't necessarily need to inject everything into log analytics to do your initial query. You can just right. query the external data directly. Yep, that's correct. So KQL absolutely supports that external data. There's an external data operator, which allows me to query across workspaces or across different you know, Azure environments, but also um, I can query on-prem. I can query in a GitHub repository or some web location. Um, Prior to this, what I've got pointed out here, this watch list capability in Microsoft Sentinel, a lot of our customers, they would actually have HR update a CSV file, potentially in you know, a storage account in Azure or maybe even on-prem, um, update it with that trusted list of users, those people that should be administrators or those people that should have access to whatever this resource is. And you can use that external data operator to, to enrich your results and kind of skip over those administrators, right? Those people that should have access to look at for those people that shouldn't have access to do certain things. Use external data operator to pull in that, that CSV file or that other data source. So it doesn't necessarily have to live in Azure, right? It could live anywhere. All right, just so um, to understand this, so you, you're putting something into this watch list and you query that and that could be something somebody else updates, right? So so the watch lists, yeah, are kind of relatively, it's still in preview, but still kind of a new feature within Microsoft Sentinel past six, seven, eight months. Um, this is a replacement for people having to do that external data source thing. These watch lists right. exist within uh, Microsoft Sentinel. However, they can still update those same CSV files, and we have mechanisms to update these watch lists with those external uh, that external stuff. So we, we're still we at this point we don't have to go externally to get that data, but we still can do that if we need to. All right. So if you had that data on prem, just as an example, you'd yeah. have to create something yourself with, I'm guessing, Graph API or something that automatically uploads it to the watch list. So there is an API, yep, yeah, that we have some playbooks or some automation that will pull that stuff in and update the watch list, yeah. Awesome. I think it's great That's for awesome. people to know. <laughs> yeah, but, but I mean, if, if you have, uh, I've done it myself. I had a uh, C, uh, uh, XML file actually in Azure Blob and just asking this directly. Yep. Just pulling in data from this directly. So with a query, don't need to... Uh, yeah, you don't need to do anything specific. You can just ask the data if you know how to, if, if it is in a format that you can actually understand. But you have like a parse raw or parse XML, parse CSV. It's one of the things you can do with external data source. Yep. There's the operator right there. And if we type that in, yep, it's in hover there. It's going to give us that information about it, right? And even a link that we can go off and learn more about it. So. Again, some of that awesome. really nice context for this tool. And would that be, you know, if you're querying directly instead of using the watch list, would that be more efficient? Like if it's a large data set, I'm guessing it's going to be slower querying <clears throat> something that's actually in a whole different location on a, it could be on a spinning disk or a floppy, I don't know. Yeah, so it, it would be better performant if it existed in the watch list, right? Because the watch list is indexed, we know about it, and it's going to be in that log analytics workspace. Hmm. Yeah, or Michael, you can do what we do, right? We can uh, use the uh, API to just inject it into a custom table directly in log analytics, and then you have the full performance on your data. Yep. 
exactly. I love that feature. Yeah, not that I'm doing really cool. much um, log analytics, but I'm injecting stuff into it. So, so a question that I I want to ask. Um, so yeah. we've seen all these queries. Do I have unlimited queries for free, or do I actually have to pay when I go above something? There's no cost to run these queries. In fact, um, if we go into, let me open this up. Um, these are our analytics rules that I was talking about a little bit earlier within Microsoft Sentinel. Again, kind of focused on the security component here. I could jump into if I shared it in my Intune environment too and show you that. But um, um, all of these queries that exist in here, particularly the scheduled queries, if you look at something, if I go and edit this one, this one's um, what? account created and deleted in a short time frame. Somebody created an account and they delete it real quickly. It might potentially be nefarious be, or an insider threat because, you know, maybe they were trying to hide their tracks or something like this. So this is good information to know. Um, but if you look at this, there's some other components here. Um, the let statement, which is essentially creating variables like in PowerShell that I'm going to utilize throughout the rest, right? I'm going to templatize this a little bit. Um, so that's, that's some... Uh, variable information that I want to use, um, but there's that table that I want to query. I'm wanting to query audit logs, but if you look at this, our analytics rules, everything that's powered that in Microsoft Sentinel, our analytics rules, our workbooks, the visualizations, and I'll show you, it's all based on this KQL query language. So just getting a good understanding of this language and then getting the links and resources to go look up the other operators you want to use, um, you can utilize all of this. So if you Go in and look, um, I have in my environment, 333 active rules. So every day at whatever time that these have been scheduled to run, every 24 hours, I have 30, 333 active, 333 rules that run every single day. These are things that I think as an analyst that are important for me to be notified of if it's happening within my environment. Now, if we go to the rule templates, um, I don't know if it's actually gonna tell me. Um, but there's even more, right, that comes straight out of the box. There's no cost for running these queries. There's no cost for these analytics rules. You can also, once you start learning your own KQL, I, of course, I can copy something from somewhere else or maybe even a GitHub repository. I can create my own from scratch. If there's something that I don't have coverage for, maybe it's a new threat, something brand new that was announced on CNBC at 4 a.m. or something, right? Somebody, some new threat actor or some new threat activity and I don't have that threat intel for it yet. Usually Microsoft is going to supply that very quickly. But if I don't, I need to know. I still need to know about that. I can just on my knowledge of KQL and knowing about my environment and where to search for that stuff. Right. We searched for Shaylon. We started looking, you know, see what she had done within the signing logs. Maybe that's the case here. It's it's maybe it's password spray or something. I can go ahead and create a custom analytics rule just going through filling out these little details and adding my KQL query here and enabling this so that I'm, it's going to automatically notify me about that new thing, right? So I don't have to have a gap in coverage. Hmm. Awesome. So I'm, I'm thinking, you know, for the lazy admins out there, there has to be some, some like cool GitHub repos to follow where somebody creates something like that, like instantly, somebody that's on the beat. Well, if or you... A community of people that are... There is a community of people. If I go to... On the beat. AS GitHub, which is the Azure Sentinel GitHub, there's actually quite a bit more of those queries that exist in our official GitHub repository. Um, this is the one from Microsoft Sentinel from the product team. Everything you see in Microsoft Sentinel exists here because of this DevOps, the CICD pipeline that we utilize to update um, Microsoft Sentinel and all of our products, obviously. There's some a lot of stuff that exists out here that doesn't exist in Sentinel because it was created either by our customers or our partners. It goes through a whole vetting process, but then it's made available in here, so people, anyone can go out here and, you know, capture all this stuff. Um, obviously, you know, I keep my own GitHub repository. There's a bunch of people within Microsoft that do their own, you know, for their KQL stuff. Um, Matt Zorch, who now works for Microsoft, who was the 365 days of KQL, if you remember that. The individual that literally created a brand new KQL query or analytics rule every day for 365 days. Um, and then uh, got hired by Microsoft because of that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, and he's, he's on a good Dart job team. decision. <laughs> yeah, he's on the Dart team. And, and there's 
his GitHub repository is out here as well. So there's at least 365 queries in his GitHub repo that people could take advantage of, right? So it's it's all over the place. So learn so very, to that take very your own thing, job. That very simple thing that we started about a year ago is just like exploded. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. I'm thinking about, um, you know, you're, we're, we're talking about security a lot around this and uh, what kind of other security products does Microsoft have? I'm thinking something called Defender, maybe. Um, it's a bit different looking in there, right? So it's you're talking about GUI before limited. this meeting started. Yeah, it's consistently changing quite a bit. Um, we have over the past year and a half, two years or something, our customers have complained that we have too many consoles. And I absolutely agree. We've done, we've had some significant <laughs> effort to try to consolidate. So if you look in what Microsoft 365 Defender now, everything is in here, right? So most everything, Endpoint Manager, um, Office 365, Cloud App Security, a few other things. And there's always new things coming along. We have other new products, which will end up here eventually. Things like Purview and Microsoft Threat Intelligence and Defender and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and they're sort of leaning on the the, the uh, admin portal, like the M365 admin portal design, right? Instead of, you know, going with the the Azure portals design, which Entra is adopting. So I'm I'm kind of yeah. confused. Where's like uh, that's not your department, I know, Trent, but but do you know, <laughs> like what what's going on with that? Why are there like two camps of design? I like the Azure portal personally, the design there. Um, um, yeah, it's just, it's like any company. Everybody has their thing, right? Um, eventually we have to get to a point where everybody shares and everybody is doing what's best for the customer. Um, I'll not comment any more than that, but I think everybody <laughs> should be focused on this customer empowerment by centralizing everything instead of making it, you know, so diverse. Um, in, yeah. in originally it was, there was this effort before this, you know, effort to kind of consolidate. Um, not all of our customers use all of our products, surprisingly, right? Not all of them use Defender, for, uh, you know, Defender for Endpoint or Defender for Cloud Apps. Some of them used one or the other, or some of our customers would like purchase the E5 agreement and then only use one of the products and they owned all of them, right? So, um, they only focus on that one product that they utilize. This, this That's centralized console would become a little bit confusing to those people. But because mm. people are starting to utilize this a little bit more, this does absolutely make a lot more sense. And if you don't have it, if you don't use that product, you, you just don't have to go access it, right? So if I don't have uh, the endpoint stuff, you know, I can just kind of close that down. It's just not going to be available to me, the options that are in there. So it's a little bit more intuitive now. Yeah. Yep. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, and the good thing about this portal, though, it's it's also adaptive when you look at what you actually have the rights to look at. So if you if you only have access to endpoints, like you have an RBAC role for Defender for endpoints, you yep. won't see all this other stuff. Um, so it, yeah. it is adapting to what role you have. But of course, if you're a security admin, you'll see most of it. Yep. Access-based enumeration. Yes. That's, Absolutely. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, and then it, this is where it comes uh, becomes interesting as well, Rob, because there's a lot of talk about hunting, right, in security, yep. and uh, you can do hunting in here, but this data is not actually in log analytics, right? This is this data is somewhere else. This data is a log analytics workspace. So yeah, it, but you it, can't it, access <laughs> this data in Azure. This right portal right absolutely yeah so and and this is a good example of that um office is a good example of that right people say office is not azure active directory but it absolutely is it's just yeah these place are these things are still kind of segmented just a little bit because when you want to connect the defender stuff to sentinel you still have to connect it and ingest it into sentinel into azure into the azure portal right so yes this does even though it's a Log, even though it's log analytics, it actually exists somewhere else. Yeah, because I've been looking into that because uh, I have a customer who uh, actually they they have a third party CM, yep. and they want to they wanted to export the logs like we do with the connector in Sentinel from here into log analytics workspace, <laughs> but there is actually no way to do that without having Sentinel. 
because if you go in and try to connect or send your stream your logs, it doesn't give you the option to stream it to log analytics. Right. It's just event hub or storage. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Where is that? So we gone straight into feature bashing. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> well, I have a list. Something yeah. that bothered me. Just, I mean, if you go into, um, if you go into the endpoints, I think it's in the endpoints, actually. Oh no, here streaming API, I think. Yeah, where'd you see it? Um, now you have it on the left. Oh, there it is. Sorry, yeah, yeah, you're right. So if you go in here, aware. you see you have. This is actually sending stuff to a log analytics workspace. It is, yeah. But if I want to send it to workspace that's not Sentinel, I can't do that. Uh, da, 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 da. So there's another way to do that. So, so it only hub. gives me event hub or storage. And so it doesn't give me that direct, I want to send this to log analytics, but I don't want to use Sentinel. Yeah. So then I'm, you see what I mean? Let me see something. There is a way to, there is a place to do that. Uh, so not everything exists within the Microsoft 365 Defender console. Some things still exist in the other separate consoles, which we'll, we'll, we'll just not talk about. Um, and I think it's, <laughs> and I think it's in there. However, um, things like, and, and we can talk about competitive products. Um, Splunk is a good example um, to ingest or send data, the egress from Defender to Splunk, you have to use the API, right? And, and there's some Splunk, uh, what do they call them? Add-ons. They have the community. Yeah, plugin. they have an add-on that talks directly <clears throat> through the defend the, the the graph or security API. Yep, basically. Yep, and that's that's how they accomplish that. But I believe there's also in the original console there's another way to do that as well. So I have to look at that later, though. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not it's it's not important. I'm just the thing though with the hunting. It's still the same language. It's still the same engine. You can yep. do the same stuff here. So if you want to find, like I say here. Uh, Inbound firewall connection blocks, right? You can find that in here. Yeah. Um, Which I don't and, have anything. No, but you, I mean, if, if you want to snoop around, you can go in here and query who was looking at this and this website um, uh, over the last the week, for instance. Yeah. Who was looking at Twitter uh, from their corporate machines during the last week? I, uh, in my company, that would be 100%, but that's. Uh, <laughs> But the thing is, like you, you can do all of these things, and and this is because the, all the data is there. But uh, there is a limit, though, in this portal, yeah. uh, and that is a maximum of ten thousand lines. Ten thousand lines returned. Return. Yeah, um, it's ten thousand here, and it's thirty thousand, I believe, still in log analytics. So it is. Yeah. Yeah, but the thing here is that it actually, even though you try to filter it down. It the initial request stops at ten thousand. Oh, I see. So before well, they were, and that's why it's very important to learn kind of that tuning that query and getting that. You know, search is great, but then you kind of have to kind of tune that till you're getting back the results exactly what you want. So yeah. Hmm. Um, yeah, I actually have a question now since we've digressed from the learning path. <laughs> ah, yeah. Um, so in in uh, the advanced hunting. Um, I would love to see if we could, um, you know, query stuff like device membership of local Azure AD groups, not 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 Azure AD, local AD groups, because you can see all that data if you go onto a device, yeah. but you can't query it like the DNS. So unfortunately, I don't I don't have Defender for Identity connected and enabled, so I couldn't. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't produce any results for that, unfortunately. Um, I don't have an on prem environment. Gosh, we should darn do that it. Already. What? Yeah, imagine that. <laughs> well, maybe Yen he can show us. I don't know. He has a lot of on prem. Yeah. He's such a legacy guy, you know. Um, <laughs> <just kidding. laughs> I, I do want to show this real quick. Um, this is kind of the yeah. future of what we're doing to enable our customers to better utilize the query, the advanced hunting without actually learning the query still important to learn it because it'll take you to the next step. Um, this is the query builder and this is kind of new here, right? Um, so I can do some filters just like I was doing before, except I'm doing some clicks, right? I want to look for Microsoft Teams, right? Um, what locations do I have? Probably nothing. Oh, US, I guess. Oh, I do have somebody from California. That's not going to bring up any, I'm not California, uh, Canada. 
Uh, it's not going to bring up. I don't think that's going to bring up anybody. Let's see. Let's just run that real quick. Get some results. And that's what I thought. Let's just tell you, change that back to US because I know I have some results. Um, so that this is kind of the future of what we're doing to enable our customers to be able to kind of take advantage of this without kind of learning the whole thing, right? Still necessary because if you're going to do anything else or you're going to go outside of this or you're going to look for some specific things that we don't have filters for, then yeah, you're absolutely going to be able, you're going to need to learn KQL. But um, this is kind of the future. And in fact, um, you'll see this. I can't really give dates or, you know, things like that, but you, you'll see this across, across a lot of other products that utilizes that utilize KQL to get results. So, And yeah. if you've clicked your way through that, is there a button to click to show the KQL so you get smarter sure. yep. while not working right. harder? Just like I could do before, I could save this, I could share this, but in the back end, there's my KQL query that was created as a result ah, of clicking stuff. That's, that's nice. That's beautiful. Yeah. I can also, if I find something really cool, just like I did with Microsoft Sentinel, I can create an analytics rule from scratch. I can also create a custom detection for scratch for Defender in this case. Absolutely cool. Yep. Awesome. So I was saying, yeah, it's a really I, good it's a really good teaching rule uh, teaching tool too, right? So create your little filters and go in and take a look at the KQL query. So. Hmm. It's pretty cool. I'm I'm uh, also thinking about something else where Microsoft is doing some cool things in in um, Defender 365 because they there's this part where you get some recommendations, right? You get some security recommendations and vulnerability related yeah. recommendations. And I've noticed that sometimes it shows you, you know, that it, that Microsoft has queried sort of the impact, the user impact for enabling some of these, uh, let's say, attack surface reduction rules. Um, but it doesn't show the KQL behind it. Is, is, is it possible to get something like that out? Uh, for like the ASRs and things like that and the uh, reporting. Yeah. Um, a lot of times the things, particularly in Defender, um, no. Um, unless you do know where the GitHub repository is for the Defender stuff because that yeah, absolutely exists out there as well. Okay, so they might actually have some more queries than than what's shown or... Because yeah. I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, it's... It's it would be a lifesaver for any admin out there that's uh, maybe you know not a wizard with all this. If they go in and see, okay, there's a recommendation to uh, disable password manager in Google Chrome or something like that, and Microsoft just shows you that you know if you enable this, 99.9% uh, .9 of your company won't even notice any effect because they've there's sort of been a query already done towards all your endpoints, and you know that that would just make the world a safer place, literally. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Just being able to I click mean, enable, enable. So we so have some capability are... like that in Defender for Cloud, right? So yeah. 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 Go ahead, Jan. I mean, Sorry. it's uh, we, we do have like like now on uh, Defender for Endpoint, you have the, uh, you can see if you have the add-ons, you can see what kind of extensions is installed. Are they, uh, do, are, do you have like rogue uh, or suspicious extensions in your Chrome? And then that really also helps. And you can query those data. But the thing with ASR rules specifically is that to be able to query the impact of ASR, you actually need to uh, put it out there in audit mode. Then it mm -hmm. will start collecting the data about what would happen if you turn it into block mode. And then you yeah, can but, query the actual output. But then you have to have learned Kusto KQL, right? So yeah, well, there my is, point actually, was just there is, like, uh, there, is, there is a predefined query for that in the hunting on the ASR stuff. Okay, cool. There are some queries in there that you can actually use. Like, I'm just being honest, I'm not working with this on a daily basis. <laughs> so <laughs> so that's why I'm here to like ask those silly questions or they're not silly, you know, they're, there they're no questions. questions. Good questions. Um, yeah. But because I'm thinking somebody's out there watching this and either A, they're like pretty advanced or B, they know nothing about it. They thought, okay, Rod Trent, to watch that and uh, maybe learn something. Um, they definitely didn't see my name and thought, oh, I'm going to learn some Kusto, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, but maybe Michael will ask the silly question. Well, you know what? I, I've, I've sat in a couple sessions with Jan and, and, and it would be super awesome if he actually did a whole 
series on it. He does some good stuff with it. So, hint, yeah, that's not wink, wink. Wink. Yeah. With yeah, well, we, we, we do we, we do have, we have focused a lot about on on workbooks, uh, you know, for um, auditing and uh, reporting and that kind of stuff. And that is really um, so the, the custom thing is one when you start doing the query, then you need to actually learn about the workbook stuff as well, how to make that look great, and 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 uh, not just have some uh, a workbook which just hundred lines of items, you need to kind of visualize it and, and look at it in a different way. So definitely uh, it's fun uh, to work with the data that way. Um, and sometimes you do something great and then Microsoft come around <laughs> and say, yeah, okay, we need to do it better. And then they start uh, doing uh, stuff, good stuff as well. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, so, and here's a good example of what Jan was talking about. Here's a workbook within Microsoft Sentinel that's available to look at, you know, workloads and, and secure security of workloads over the past 90 days. You see all this stuff. It looks, that's neat, right? It's pretty. That's some pretty cool reports. It's not Power BI great, but it's it's still pretty cool. It's a good day to look at um, activity by workload, activity by type. Um, I can take a look at activity by user types and things like this. But if I go into edit, and drop down to one of these right here. Oh, look at that. It's a KQL query that is literally powering that entire visualization. So every widget there is just a query and a selection of how it's supposed to look. That's yeah, right. and you have you can choose the visualization here on the top where it says visualization. So you can change that to be something else. Yeah. I like see. pie. That's a like pie chart. Easy go. on the eyes. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's kind of boring. No, it's, I, it's very boring. I just, I was talking about the food, you know. Uh, okay. It, well, it is, thanks, <laughs> it is U.S. Thanksgiving, so there's a lot of pie going on. So I oh, that. definitely. Yeah. So uh, the story behind this is go build KQL and then learn how to do workbooks and then go grab whatever is inside the portal today. Go to MS Endpoint Manager. They, Maurice, Jan... Sandy, not me. Ben, <laughs> yeah, not not me either. Uh, created no. awesome workbooks to learn a lot of KQL sentence from, and where to get this data. So it's so rich. Go download it, put it into your test tenant or your production, whatever, and and try it out. And yeah, and put it on GitHub. It. You know, yes, learn, share it. Yeah, build, share, repeat. Yes. Yeah, that's the that's the way and the, you know, you know the, the best thing the best thing about Custo, if you go into log analytics and you start querying stuff, you can't destroy anything. That's right. You, yeah. you can play as much as you want, you're never gonna destroy anything by doing Custo. But you can, of course, with the right permission, go and delete tables manually and, and do stuff. But just by doing query language, you're not destroying anything. You can just play play as much as you want. It doesn't cost anything if the data is there already and you can't destroy anything. I think that's actually a very, very good point, Jen. So so if I was in IT and I thought I want to get started with this, but I don't really have access to it, then the request for that access would probably be a lot easier because I could, you know, go to him whomever would grant that and say I'm not gonna, you know, I'll just have a read only access basically and I can get started with some let's say some safe data, maybe not what people are surfing in the company. Uh, that no, might not I mean, be something I mean, you could grant access to yeah, immediately. But. but there are also, as uh, Rod mentioned earlier, if you go to his uh, Muscle Learn Kick well, uh, website, there is a free demo environment you can also use, like a shared environment where you can do your queries. Yep, and uh, that is also a good way of learning. De yep. Demo data is great. You know, I just know from experience and a lot of people I talk to, uh, you know, we're going to talk about neurodiversity here, but uh, some people have to see a purpose with it other than to just demo data. So I know there there's going to be some people that want to learn with something that, that makes sense to them in their daily operations, perhaps something that they can relate to. And other people will be fine with, you know, demo data. Um, so you can learn in production. I'm just, uh, no, I didn't say that, but 
but you can. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well I, you, you, it doesn't it is matter if it's a shave. Yeah. yeah, it is read only and pre- even in production. But if you're not comfortable with that, just like Jan said, you can go to that aka.ms slash custo free or this environment that I'm showing right here. If you go to aka.ms la demo, which is log analytics demo, all of this data right here exists for free, too. You can you can go in and you can't destroy it. You can go and start doing some searches here. This is security data and, and security and metrics for Azure. But um Custo free, of course, you can ingest anything you want. So, very, and very you can nice. start building those nice graphic workbooks from here as well. Asking for um, you can build, start building the queries for those graphic workbooks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my suggestion, though, there's a lot of really good workbooks out there already, even in the products, but also in you know GitHub repositories. It's really easy to copy the code from a workbook into your environment, and just copy it in there and save it and then you can start taking a look at those queries yourself go into those little modules and you can mix and match i'm going to create a brand new workbook i'm going to take this one from this workbook and this one from this workbook i'm just going to stick all these kql queries into my own little workbook and create something special all your own cool that's the community nice. spirit yeah guys we are approaching one and a half hour and uh, people is uh Getting tired, I am sure. <laughs> Even You'll though cut this it down. is very interesting. But I need to ask Super. one last question here. Any cool yep. gadgets uh, we, we can get? KQL, the t shirt you have, Rod, um, t shirt marks, stickers. What are the giveaways, Rod? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So, so there, there, let me go in here real quick. Go Obviously, people will pay. So. So yeah, there aren't really giveaways. One of the things that um, really came about as part of the must learn KQL thing, people are like, hey, I want to give back, right? I've learned so much. This has enhanced my career. How can I give back? Good buddy of mine, John Savile, does a weekly YouTube show. Um, and so I asked him because he has all kinds of t-shirts and stuff. And <laughs> He's asked, Mr. T-shirt, right? Yeah. I said, how do you do this? <laughs> he sent me to Teespring, to spring.com. Um, and you can actually, I thought this was super amazing. You can actually request that the payouts for people that, you know, they go and acquire, you know, swag goes directly to, you know, um, something of your choice. So I chose St. Jude, right? So yeah, this stuff is out here and you kind of have to buy it if you want to invest, you know, in your KQL knowledge or invest in the series and kind of give back. But really, you're actually really giving back because, all of the proceeds, all the profits here go directly to St. Jude. So somebody buys one of these, you know, cups or shirts or whatever. Um, uh, it all goes directly to St. Jude. There's a bunch of, and if you're, you know, one of those folks that absolutely love the holidays, there's some brand new stuff out here. Um, I don't have the KQ, KQL one on right now, but people love this thing. There's laptop stickers. There's all kinds of stuff. Um, there's also, I don't know if you knew this, there's also... A seasonal KQL song. If anybody wants <laughs> to crazy. sing that to the tune of Noel, they can go ahead. Um, the KQL. No, I'll I'll leave people's <laughs> ears alone. That was a good, um, a good <laughs> song, Michael. That's that was pretty yeah. good. I, may have uh, to record you I, I do a mean KQL. caroling, bro. Yeah. Don't come at me. You know. <laughs> Um, but um, I just want to uh, just want to uh, have you explain something, uh, Rod, just for the people that are not in the United States. Yeah. Uh, St. Jude's is a cancer research organization for uh, children. Awesome. Such a good cause. That's, yeah, uh, that's awesome. That's uh, very nice of you to to support them. Um, Doom in the morgue. Uh, it's sort of a gloomy text. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, I guess, I guess it is. I... Did you write it, Rod? Of course Be I honest. did. I oh, okay. It. You're you're just going to say that. That's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's Well, you uh, can imagine when sweet. I created this, sweet. I was literally humming this thing to myself while I was doing it, right? I'm sitting here <laughs> singing it to myself. People thought, probably thought I was weird. What the heck is he doing in there? And you were in the office or you were at the home office? Oh, home oh. office, but still my family thinks I'm weird too. So that's, that's another story. Oh, weird is good in yeah, my I book. Yeah, I think so. I yeah. Think so so I, I think more we're, weird. Uh, we're wrapping up. Yeah, right? we're my wrapping up. Yeah. yeah. 
this was very, very uh, learnful. Um, think people who's going to watch this uh, series of of KQLing um, really going to to play with KQL, uh, play with the workbooks, uh, get that defender stuff inside your company to to start having some purpose using the KQL, right? Um, yeah. So really, just want to embrace. Uh, Start KQLing, man. And, I'm uh, super motivated. I'm going I'm to start learning this now. I'm going to go do the detective thing and then make Rod proud, uh, yeah. basically. <laughs> make, se- make December your KQLing month. Yeah, yes. I have I have budget deadlines and stuff, but I need to make. Uh, no, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'll I'll do the uh, I'll Ingest do the KQL. Ingest all your uh, budget data into a log analytics workspace. Use KQL to cut your time in half. Yeah, yeah. Did I make my uh, my budgets did i meet them <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right exactly. so um, everyone yeah. thank you so much for attending and thank you rod for for making time for us really. oh, i appreciate, appreciate it, it. Awesome. 